Recovered Addict Podcast, Jason Rigby. Dwayne Yardman Frank. What's up, yo? Are we you, are excited because we're going to get into Rudolf Steiner, Eckhart Tolle. We're going to get into Carl Jung. And we're going to talk about Oprah. Heavy hitters. <laughs> the spiritual heavy hitters. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's amazing to me when I, when I think of Oprah, I always think of her show and then where she came from with the abuse. Um, and then, you know, being raised in, you know, the area of Chicago that mm-hmm. wasn't the greatest, you know, still having issues. And here it is, 2023, which amazes me, you know, uh, where we all have, you know, extreme poverty here in the United States. But then we feel like we can send billions of dollars to other countries and, you know, not even help the people that are closest to us, you know, here mm-hmm. in the United mm-hmm. States. So that, that's horrific. But when I look at um, Oprah and then I see all the success she had, Billy, first billionaire and all that. And then she turned around and she made these Soul Sundays, these podcasts, and just did all the spiritual teachings. And I know we've talked about it several times, but kind of share with everyone, if you want, let's just start off the bat, something they can watch and see and hear from Oprah. Yeah, you know, um, such an incredible story, and I'm blessed to have been exposed to her teachings and the Soul Sundays. And one of the first ones she did on the internet was with Eckhart Tolle. And it was a 10-part series um, on Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth. Mm. His second book. It was, I think, I'm pretty sure his second book, at least his second most popular book. Um, but at this time... It, the internet was not a real fantastic, high-powered, right. functioning machine yet. They crashed the internet. Oh, almost a million people logged on on the first episode and that's crashed nuts. the yeah, internet. They, so. <laughs> they lost all of their <laughs> viewers and then came back, and by the second episode, they had already had 11 million views. And for someone in that position to share spiritual principles and want to give that to the world mm-hmm. because of the platform she's able to, to tap into. Yeah, so it was beautiful. just so awesome and so motivating. And that specific 10-part series, A New Earth with Oprah and Eckhart, revolutionized my life. What did it do with you seeing it through the lens of, of that show and watching those, whether they're on YouTube or whatever, with your addiction? It was exactly YouTube is how I viewed it. And um, basically, I had already been sober for eight years when I was exposed to this video. And my addiction had resurfaced. I was not dying from my alcoholism anymore, but I was dying from my identification relationships. Mm. I needed a relationship to be okay. I needed a relationship to make me who I am. Look at this woman on my arm. Aren't I a good guy? Isn't she gorgeous? How good of a guy must I be? I was, I look, at I'm lifting them up. I'm helping her. I'm helping her children. I had such this savior, ego, identity wrapped up in this relationship. And that went away. I lost, the, the relationship left. Mm. And I lost my identity. And it was this beautiful moment in time for me where I was cracked open and I was vulnerable and I was seeking for a solution. And it was actually my roommate at the time sent me this video. And she was like, I think you'd like this. And it was Oprah and Eckhart's 10 So you got a window series. of grace. This window of grace. Someone sent me a YouTube video and I clicked on it. And I got hooked. And I listened every episode over and over again. And Eckhart's, one of his main teachings in that book is the disidentification from the ego. If my... Identity is wrapped up in the world of form, I'm in trouble because the world of form is very transient. It changes, people come and go, relationships come and go. And I lost my identity when I lost that relationship and I didn't know who I was anymore. Should I kill myself? Am I nobody? And the disidentification that we, that I had the opportunity to go through with that 10 part series and that book it helped me step into freedom. I didn't have to identify with a relationship. I didn't have to identify with anything in the world of form after watching that 10-part series. Yeah, that's amazing. And I had watched it too. It was different for me. It was more of a, a realization of understanding 
Eckhart Tolle's big teaching of being present. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I watched it, I kind of like, oh, okay, uh, this new earth, you know, what does that look like? Oh, well, I can create my own matrix. If I stay present, then I'm not getting, the ego is not coming in. My emotions aren't as strong. So it was kind of more, there wasn't nothing happening in my life that I would propose as being bad, which, you know, um, in the book of Revelations, this is really funny. Uh, there's there's a scripture in there where Jesus was talking, and he's like, I'd rather you be hot or cold, mm. but if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Yeah, You know, and it's like nothing, unfortunately, you would think that when things are going just a-okay, everything's mediocre, you think we would learn from that and step up our game, but it's not. It's something, the, the, something bad has to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, should I kill myself? I, this is my identity was wrapped in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And then now... It's like, oh my God, here's a window of grace through this horrific trauma that I'm experiencing, drama, trauma. Yep. And now I have an opportunity to comprehend and understand and allow the spiritual teaching to take root inside my soul. But it's so funny how we have to have those cracked egg moments. Yeah, you know? yeah it's so powerful and it's also so painful. I used, to ask, yes. I used to ask one of my spiritual advisors, I said, how come I, used to, I have to always eat shit and almost die mm -hmm. to learn the lesson? And he says, that's just the way you're wired, man. <laughs> that's the way you got to go through it. I wish soft and pretty and, 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 and love and light were the way that I learned lessons, but it's just not. Spirit, you always call them spiritual two by fours. So spiritual yeah. two by fours. It's like getting hit upside the head <laughs> with a cosmic two by four. Like, yeah. That's what I need to wake up sometimes. And uh, unfortunately, when God does open heart surgery, he does not use anesthetic. Yeah, no. Like when we go through that hard stuff, it's painful. And if I don't have spiritual tools, present moment tools to get through that pain, often it's very easy to return to my addiction. Yeah, that's... Or, and then, you know, worst case scenario, a lot of people, that's when they take their lives because they don't know how to get through that. Chaos is too much chaos. Yeah, and it's like it's a short circuit. The ego short circuits and then it doesn't, and we'll get into this, but it doesn't understand the difference between who I really am and what I think that I am, mm. you know, and, and what I think that I am is all ego mm -hmm. and all that is what I think I am. All that is, is the amount of years. And we've talked about this before. It's just the amount of years of programming, whether you're raised a Catholic and you went to Catholic school and you know, you're Hispanic, you know, or you were like me raised down South in a fundamentalist Baptist uh, background, mm -hmm. you know, where it was a lot of racism and, you know, it's just these biases, beliefs, the trauma, the drama that we experienced that sets us as who we are. Evolutionary psychology has talked about this. Yeah. And you went into and we're, we'll get into this in a little bit, but I want you to tell the snake story. But I think it's so important when we look at, and, and this is our lesson module today, and we'll get into this, unraveling the ego. And it starts off as, as we navigate the path to addiction recovery, it's essential to understand our psyche's intricate facets, primarily our ego. The ego in the realm of psychology, especially as outlined by Sigmund Freud and further expanded by Carl Jung, and I, I like Carl Jung's, uh, he has a lot of spiritual teachings, so that kind of resonates more with me than Freud. Um, me too. Represents our conscious mind, the rational thinking self that interacts with the world. So let's get into that. Um, the rational thinking self. The part of me that thinks, the part of me that interacts with the world. If I don't know I'm separate from that, I think I am my thoughts. Very, very dangerous. Especially if I'm having horrible thoughts. Uh, Ego-based thoughts. I'm going to kill myself thoughts. I don't know how to survive thoughts. I don't want to be here thoughts. This existence is not worth it. Those are dangerous thoughts. And if I don't have the tools to disidentify, I think I am those thoughts. Yeah, like, uh, uh, you know, a whole bottle of Jack sounds really good right now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I really, really, really need, you know, to go just drive around in the middle of the night and go talk to some people and see what I can do. Yeah. You know, those things are so dangerous. Or I'm going to go, there's a party, and so I'm going to go over there. You know, it's 11 o'clock at night. I got invited to parties. So I'll just go. I won't drink, but I'll just go. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the ego. Yeah. What do you think, like, 
and, and, and our, we're going to get into the role and the function of the ego. But I want people to understand we're, we're not painting a picture that the ego is all bad. No, it is necessary, and it's a working part of the mind. Um, it's also what helps me navigate the world. When I'm blinded by my ego, or I don't know that I'm separate from my ego, that's when I'm, I'm in, in dangerous territory. That's when I'm in dangerous territory. Yeah, I'm not the hammer. The hammer is just a tool. Very good. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also, um, you know, it talked about this, this is where the, the rational thinking self really, uh, this is what's so life saving for me is realizing I'm not my thoughts. Mm, yes. I'm not even my thoughts. Most people navigate the world on two levels, situation and energetic response. Level one, situation. Level two, energetic response. And that's all I think the world is made up of. And I have a thought about the situation which produces an energetic response, and then that's who I am. I am the anger. I am the judgment. These people at Walmart are pissing me off. And I was just I, at Walmart earlier. I don't, go, earlier. I don't go any further than that. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got fishing line yeah. and gum. <laughs> That's the two requests, That's which is funny. The fishing line was for um, to hang these crystals we got off the website that you, but you hang them in the window and then it shines and oh, makes cool. this, you know, like rainbow effect, almost mm -hmm. like a disco ball effect, but it looks real pretty next to our plants. So I need a fishing line to hook them on, you know, to hook them into the window. And then um, my girlfriend's uh, daughter wanted um, some gum. Yeah. So I was like, sure, I'll get you some gum. So some special cubed gum, you know, the cube gum or whatever. So I literally went in there and got <laughs> gum and fishing line. And I was like, these two things are needed, but no one would make the core. That's the beautiful part about Walmart. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how many items Walmart has. You know what? There has to be thousands and thousands. Uh, yeah. I know that they're one of the single largest grossing companies on the globe. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think they make more than the gas companies combined. I think they're the leading employment corporation in america wow i think you know which if you, they were saying if you think about it walmart it has so many hundreds of thousands of employees that they have multiple murderers wow as an employee <laughs> they, they just don't know to. it yet it's just you know? the numbers yeah yeah it's not minority report yet remember that with tom cruise <laughs> yeah, where they good. did the computer ahead of time I would, yeah yeah and they go catch him ahead of time yeah and that's all like you were going to do this but this is all the rational thinking self, and I've seen programs, and you have too, built off on the foundation being the rational thinking self. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to build off the ego. Spiritual teachings and religion will do this. Very, yes, yes. Um, so you have to be very careful. And a lot of like universities now and the colleges and our political system, mm -hmm. all of these things are built off of, um, you know, it's the Tower of Babel. You know, I want to, and you know about this, <coughs> excuse me, but we're going to be like God. Let's, let's build something yes. so high that we are as high as God. Yeah, we're spectacular. Look yes. what we can do. Yes. And that's that rational thinking mind. That's the, the mind taking over and turning around and saying, you don't need mm. any spiritual teachings. You don't need a program. You don't need a mentor. I got you. Yeah. You're good enough. <laughs> yeah, you're good enough. Yeah. You and your own programming, you're good enough. If if I completely comprehended God, I would try and compromise it. Mm. And I'd try I would try and be just as big, if not bigger. Mm -hmm. Which part of me wants to be just as big, if not bigger? Which part of me wants to compete? Which part of me keeps score? It's not my spirit. No, and the ego helps, like it helps with competition, like mm -hmm. in the sense if you're playing a game or back in the day for survival. Yes. You know, we I wouldn't know. be here right now if our ancestors didn't have an ego. Absolutely necessary for survival. And one of the things, when we get into understanding the ego and embrace it, and Eckhart Tolle returned with this, he talks about this too, the role and the function of the ego, you know, is, and my biggest thing is whenever I feel like I'm coming up with ego, uh, and I can tell that it's not a good thought. I just send loving awareness to it. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. going to recognize that's not me. I'm looking at this thought instead of fighting the thought, cause that's just more ego. I'm just going to bring love to it. 
Like just, just awareness and love. Here you go. And when I serve at that, it loses its power because the emotion goes away. The, uh, the, the urge. Yes. That urge is what gets you in trouble. The urge to go through Krispy Kreme, the urge to, you know, we talk about all the addictions to go to the casino on your board on a Sunday afternoon, you know, the urge to get that next cigarette, you know, or whatever it may be. That it's so powerful. That's not becoming the thought. Which part of me can mm, say, good, yeah. which part of me can say, send love and light to that thought. It's not the situation and it's not my energetic response. It's the part of me that's present enough to know the difference, the mm. aware space that knows that's not who I am. That's a crazy thought. That's a selfish thought. That's a, that's a victim-based thought. I'm not a victim anymore. I don't have to have that thought. A belief is just a thought that you keep thinking. So we're very interested in just rewiring the thinking. Mm -hmm. Have better feeling thoughts. Yeah, and it's just practice. I mean, you're used to however old you are. Mm -hmm. That's how long. And then plus you have... Generational issues, generational and, traumas, family yes. traumas. So we we will say um, it's only partly personal, right? Like you have your personal experience, right. Dwayne and his thirty-five years of existence. But then the other part is what you've inherited mm -hmm. from generations, or maybe even your culture. And the other part is literally like billions of years of conditioning, evolutionally. Yes. Yes. Evolutionally, we had to have come from somewhere probably primates and primates have been uh, dealing with predators for over a hundred thousand years longer our separation from primates happened around a hundred thousand years ago and the part of the brain this is very interesting I just was I've been studying this recently but the part of the brain that um, fires, the neurological circuitry that fires when I curse, when I call someone the F word, or I use a short derogatory term to curse someone, is the same part of the brain neurological wiring that fires when a primate calls out to warn the, everybody else in the family there's a predator. They have a different call for snakes. They have a different call for cats. And they have a different call for birds. And it's the same part of the brain that fires when human beings curse unconsciously. That's the part of the brain that is not uh, inhibited in Tourette's syndrome. syndrome. That's why people with Tourette's curse. It's ancient. Sense, yes. It's ancient. It's over 150,000 years old, older than that. The very interesting part about that is, is the monkey, and evolutionally, a million years ago, was trying not to die from this predator. But now, Dwayne Yardman, at Walmart, cursing the obese person because I have a judgment in my head, is going down this neurological wiring system, millions of years old, that views this person as a predator. I've categorized them as predator in my mind, less than a millisecond, I've already judged them, and I've already cursed them. It's ancient, it's ancient. We've been doing this for millions of years. We're very interested in evol evolving past this old neurological wiring, taking responsibility for our evolution and choosing to be something better, choosing to go beyond the conditioned response. If I get to exist in that conditioned response, then that person is the tyrannical predator and I can be the victim prey. And victims never recover. Do you think that when you look at, uh, let's say for instance with your example, the bottle, Mm -hmm. and that you're a victim to the bottle. Um, and you basically, I think all addicts have a love-hate relationship with their addiction. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially as it progresses. Yeah. Initially, it's all straight romance. It's just like, <laughs> it's so wonderful. She answers every call. Yes. She doesn't talk back. She does exactly what she she's supposed exactly to do. She does exactly what I ask her to do. Mm -hmm. She's reliable. She's a little mm -hmm. expensive. But then, you know, I just get cheaper versions. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> a bottle then, of Jack. Is and, then, and then when, when I'm desperate enough, I don't pay at all. I just steal it. I always, I always when we go to Total Wine... Um, because my girlfriend, she likes uh, like high end tequilas or whiskeys. Mm. That's kind of her thing, and and she's not an addict or anything like that. She has other addictions, but not that one. But she enjoys that, and um, it's so funny. Like the other day, I had, there was a guy in front of me, and they have like plastic bottle whiskey in a six pack. <laughs> so it literally is like fifths, six fifths. Oh goodness! And you hold a handle. Yeah, yeah. and they're plastic bottles. With the plastic lid on top. Super so here cheap. I am holding like a $90 bottle of whiskey and a 60 or $70 bottle of tequila, whatever. And I'm like, oh, oh you know, this is a lot of money for you to just drink and piss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working on my addiction. Yes, the lack fear of, of money. Yeah, yeah, fear of money. Yes. And then I'm staring, judging this guy, and I'm like, look at this alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at this alcoholic. He's got a six-pack with plastic. Drink that with a straw. Because he's probably drinking one of those a night. This will probably last him for the week. Wild. And, you know, it's just, it, it, you're so right. It's like this us versus me. And my ego, and we'll get into this, um, but the ego always wants to work in the realm, and our material talks about this, in the work in the realm of forming our identity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. form is a very important word. In Genesis, it talked about you know, God came and he formed uh, man out of the dust of the earth. You know, the, the word form, you know, and in the, in the Hebrew, this is a really important word. It, it's, it's not just creating. Um, it's taking su substances and making them something that is whole. Mm. You know, so whenever we're looking at our ego, it's taking all the millions of stimuli responses mm, Krispy Kremes are delicious mm, the casino is the best thing. you know that that dopamine hits I get as I push the button over and over and over again ding, 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 ding. you know or oh yeah that the uh, when I can drive at nighttime and go along that strip and look at the prostitutes and see which I'm going to pick out mm -hmm. you know with my sex addiction whatever that addiction may be it's taking all of that in and then the ego's forming an identity very interesting and, and Carl Jung talks about this identity as being the shadow self you know, and and the, the material gets really into this. It says the ego plays a pivotal role in forming our identity, facilitating our interaction with the external world. So your brain can't see. Your brain is totally reliant on all the other aspects of your body. It's totally reliant on your ears. It's totally reliant on your nose. It's totally reliant on your eyes. The brain is is what if you just had a brain and it could function on its own, it would be knocking things over it's in the dark <laughs> it's totally in the Always dark in the dark and so it's just relying on stimuli and then through your consciousness and your subconscious it's trying to rationalize all of that in a way to protect itself mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and you can watch this play out so well and you you know because you have a two-year-old right two yep. and a half exactly your old half. son and he's a little mini you. Yeah, it's exactly like it, whatever I have, he has. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he's gonna, you're going to have to work with him on addictions when he gets older. Yeah. But when you look at him, his stimulant, the, the stimuli that he's getting, whether he's sitting on the couch with you watching TV, you're watching golf, and he's just, you know, holding his little sippy cup watching golf, I could imagine, or whatever, just overly stimulated, or whether he sees a piece of candy. Mm hmm You know, I mean, and, and you could talk to this, but... He's absorbing so much information. And then that information, like, I'm going to scream at mom. I know I can't scream at dad, you know, because dad will discipline me. But mom, I can probably get away with. That's how I was when I was little. I could, I could, uh, dad was always kind of the, uh, you know, and he's passed away. So, but he was always kind of more of the disciplinarian. Of course. So, and, and maybe that plays a role with, with everyone here. So I knew I could get away more of my mom. And my mom would like give in, give in, give in. And then she would, she had anger issues like I, you know, did. We were talking about that earlier. Um, so she, then she'd fly off the handle. Yeah. You know, go get the belt or whatever yeah. and then spank yeah. the shit out of us. But it was always like 
the stimuli there, the overwhelmed feeling, and then and you you can watch him in his face. He gives in to that stimuli. He doesn't know at two and a half that he's separate from that. No, he he's doesn't totally know how to when he's screaming. Himself. Yeah, because he wants something. He's into that. He it's it, the, for the child. It's almost like like losing a limb. Mm-hmm. Like the water is my arm, and I need to have my water. I'm screaming, yelling for my water. I'm telling him I, I, almost every day, son. Ask respectfully for your water. You don't need to scream and cry for your water. And it's exactly as you said. He knows he can push mom a little further, and dad's the disciplinarian. Um, I'm the increased responsibility. But simultaneously, I don't want to be the tyrant of the house that everyone's afraid of. I want him to learn that he's separate from his mental abstraction of the water bottle. And we're not talking bad, like because uh, uh, I want people to understand, the feminine side of things is beautiful because it operates with grace. Absolutely. Um, the male side of everything is, the masculine side of everything is beautiful because it operates with law. Yes. So when you have grace and law together. You need both. You need the scale, yep. the law scales to weigh things back and forth to create order. And you need the grace, the forgiveness. And Jesus was a, a, a typical uh you know, I mean, he displayed that feminine and masculine, you know, yes, uh, back and forth, showing tremendous amounts of, of, of grace and healing. You know, the feminine side is like a lot of healers, spiritual healers, Reiki healers, whatever, will be uh, females. Mm-hmm. They're more receptive to that than us dumbasses. Yeah, we need, we need both. <laughs> and that's the, it's the Tao symbol as well. It's order chaos. It's yes. one of the oldest teachings there is. Like, if we don't have both, I, uh, too much order is death, and too much chaos is death. But what do you see? Like, wh- how do you see the ego play out, your little boy? It's developing in him, <laughs> and uh, you know, kids are all ego. They don't think that right. they're separate. They don't. He doesn't know how to separate himself from the world, or a water bottle, or his chicken nuggets, or whatever it may be. Um, so it's interesting. What is really most interesting is seeing him navigate his emotions, and then not dropping to the vibration of a two-year-old. It's my responsibility to vibrate at a level higher than whatever the aroused situation is. Because I can go there just as easily. I'm, I'm telling him to stop yelling about the water bottle, Why but yelling I'm at yelling at the top of my lungs, <laughs> freaking out, because this kid I doesn't love that. know yeah, he's so separate true. from the water bottle, and I met him at his vibration. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't, it wasn't a very good parenting example from dad. It was more like, well, that's how dad does things. I'm going to do this too. So I'm reaffirming the uh, disidentification of who he really is. <laughs> so I want, I want to be a, in a vibration above that, and teach him in a way where he, he can learn he's separate from the world. He gets to honor the world. He's a part of the world. But that's not what makes him him. The water bottle doesn't have anything to do with his identity. His thoughts about the water bottle doesn't have anything to do with his identity. Your, your description of how the ego is constantly grabbing stimuli and trying to form a cohesive understanding of the world put my identity whole is was so beautiful, bro. You nailed it. That's, that's what's going on for all of us all the time. And our brain does it so well. We don't even know it's happening. Do you remember the movie, uh, beautiful minds or whatever? It's fantastic. And Russell Crowe. It, it's taking all this information he's, and, and it's like an illusion. Yeah. Schizophrenia. Yeah. It's schizophrenia, but he's taking all of the stuff that he believes is really happening to him. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to put all the puzzle pieces together. And I always picture my ego in that same moment. I pictured my higher self coming and being like, this is an illusion, bro. Look, you're schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's really what's happening. <laughs> yes, yes. To all of us at a certain level. And, and so I always pictured that chaos of the numbers and putting puzzle pieces together. And, I'm, you know, like serial killers with, the, you know, the detectives have the big maps and they put mm-hmm. the pins. And then they have laid out everywhere victims and then a triangle with string you know you see that on shows and that's what my ego is trying to do yes but you know how many puzzle pieces it has to figure out how many stimuli it has simultaneously all day every day even when we're sleeping and then it has to rationalize it all yeah the if i'm lost if if i'm lost in my mind and i'm lost in fear i'm lost in terror we were talking about this earlier at the gym i'm lost in my ego 
and I'm, I'm, I, I identify with these emotions, I enter the sympathetic nervous system. Mm-hmm. My sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. Fight or flight releases cortisol. That cortisol hormone in my body is very, very important for survival and very, very useful in short-term intervals. Gets me through a workout, gets me through anything challenging and is important and necessary. But if I sustain high levels of cortisol, I'm constantly in fear in my mind. I'm constantly in stress because I'm lost in my thoughts. I'm constantly in fear because my addiction has a hold of me and I don't have a way out. Those high levels of stress and cortisol relief are powerful enough to deteriorate the mind. That's what schizophrenia is. Mm-hmm. It's, it's deep, deep levels of constant stress, constant anxiety, constant fear. The mind can no longer differentiate. That's a delusion. That part of the brain has been dissolved from the cortisol. Mm-hmm. And the addiction, if you have an addictive personality, that plays out, and I'm going to relate to both of us right now. In war, you have that same scenario. It's fight or flight. I'm running, 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 busy, 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 drama, 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 do, do, do. And a lot of people that have addictive personalities are also waiters, waitresses, bartenders, because for eight hours, you could experience cortisol levels it's high. Go, 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 drama, drama, People, drama. Ah, this constantly, is going on, the bar's changing. backed up. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's uh, it's we addiction. Like to say it's life or uh, it's not life or death. It's lunch and dinner. And it's like no no, it's life and death. We're gonna treat it like lunch and life and death. This chicken is important. But don't you think that some people they just operate at this high level of ego and sympathetic nervous system, and they get addicted to that. Even their work, absolutely, I think becomes that. I would say majority of functional people is that's how they exist. Absolutely. That's definitely how I navigated the world, especially the restaurant industry for years. Um, it's easy to get addicted to that fast pace, constantly changing, problem solving environment that my brain is good at that. But it's simultaneously easily, I was easily addicted to the cortisol released mm-hmm. during that experience, except I didn't have the education to articulate that. I didn't know that that's what was happening. I didn't know I was getting addicted to an emotion, to an energetic response, mm. to a chemical reaction in my body. I, why do I keep going back to this crazy environment? Yeah, and if you want to test this out, this is how I test it out. If I'm too much in the sympathetic instead of the parasympathetic is when I try to meditate. Mm-hmm. Not possible. If you can't, yeah, it's not possible. Like, so uh, an addict's personality, like the other day I did 12 minutes. You know, but I visualize and I, I have to be active meditation. I haven't gotten to the point to where... I have a friend of mine I've shared with you, you know, he can sit there for an hour and no thought, just an hour, like that's just wild. pure. And, and it's taken years and years and years of development to do that. But that's total parasynthetic when you're, they've tested that. Yes. You're also, you've talked to me about this where they've, it, there's like a gamma wave or something that happens when you meditate. Like you're in that super high level, the highest of the brain, there's mm-hmm. an alpha, beta, gamma wave, you know, and they've done that with monks where they've put the brain sensors on them and then had them go into meditation. So if you can't meditate for five seconds, <laughs> yes, yes, you know where you're at. Yeah, you're in the sympathetic. And <laughs> you know, one of Eckhart's great teaching is, is one conscious breath is a meditation. Mm-hmm. Just one conscious breath. But I have to be present. I have to be conscious, choosing to honor that breath in order to do it. And in a chaotic situation, when I'm blinded by my ego, I can't even get one breath. No, we're addicted to that. That's, 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 what we, that's how we want to run our lives. And it's interesting because that's the ego's job, making my identity whole. Mm-hmm. The ego thinks it's doing its job. It's, I'm wrapped <laughs> yes, up in yes. all this stuff around me, and it's very easy to get lost in that. Very easy to not know or understand I'm separate from that. Yeah, and, it, and it's, we talked about this, but it's a way to process, like the material says, the external world. Yes. Yes. I don't know that I'm not the center of attention at two and a half. I don't know that my thirst is not that important. I'm not dying. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I can't go get the sippy cup myself on the table. So what am I going to do? My emotional response is to scream bloody murder because I can get attention. I know I get what I want when yes. I make this sound. Yes. Yeah. And that's the way we are. It, there's no difference between Jason Rigby at 50, compared to, you know, your little boy at two and a half. 
My the egos are the same. Yep. Mine's just become more developed over time and plays like lots of tricks on me. Sneakier. <laughs> yeah, it's more sneakier. <laughs> and and this is really good. It says it distinguishes between our eternal thoughts, feelings, and external reality. Internal thoughts and feelings, external reality. Two separate things. Very separate. It distinguishes between internal thoughts. My internal thoughts are not the same as my external reality. That's what a healthy ego can do. Mm -hmm. That's what my ego is designed to do, especially if it's submissive to the part of me that's vertical dimension. If it's submissive to the part of me that's present, my soul, my consciousness, I want that forefront. We talk about this a lot in our podcast. We're going to keep bringing it up. The vertical dimension of spirit, I want that to be where I make decisions from, not the horizontal dimension of form where my ego doesn't know it's separate from its external circumstances. Yeah, and, and whenever it's, it's, and this is really, really good. It says, however, an unchecked ego can become a formidable obstacle to personal growth and recovery. Mm. So an unchecked ego. So if there was no discipline in the home with your, we'll, we'll just go back to your son here. Two and a half because it's perfect because it's, I think it's a perfect representation of our ego, just crying and screaming all the time, wanting whatever it wants. Yeah. And, and every child, I have four kids, so, you know, all of our kids did this, and we did this when we were two and a half. Um, unchecked, in the sense of, and I always think of like a, a list. So every morning I have it over there, my to-do list for today, you know, and I break it down in categories for different things that I need to accomplish, and then I have like to the side, almost like an outline, you know, like this podcast, and then I have four things that I need to do, mm -hmm. you know, and then you know, my work and then d the different forms of work. And then I have two things in each and it's a checklist. And then I check the stuff I got done. And then I look at it at the end of the day and be like, well, kind of shitty today, you know, or you did kind of good today. What, why were you distracted? You know, I do like a self-aware practice on that. That's awesome. But if I didn't have the checklist, if I didn't have a self-aware practice, then I'm just being reactive. Mm -hmm. to work i'm being reactive to life i'm being reactive to anything so to me the word unchecked because i don't want people to think of it like a hockey check no like unchecked ego like you need to check your ego bro that's not what we're talking about when it says unchecked ego it's it's this reactive instead of proactive you know the, I, the reason i make that list <clears throat> the whole reason i make a list is so that i can prioritize what's important very good. Yeah. And eliminate yeah. the things. So if I'm getting all the stimuli from the world, so I'm watching Netflix and I'm getting this stupid shit, you know, and I'm watching, <laughs> um, you know, HBO and I'm getting this, you know, and then somebody has a reality show on that I hate, but I keep hearing it. I don't want to listen to that bullshit, you know, yeah. or, or, you know, I drive by and I see McDonald's. Mm, that sounds good. Cheeseburger be perfect, you know, or Krispy Kreme. All this stimuli reality if i've had the checklist mm. then i know it's like uh why do you have a calendar why does a doctor send you a calendar request yep you know i just got one from the doctor to, that you know monday at this time i've got to be at the doctor and i'm going to go and show up and be there it's on my calendar it will remind me my phone will remind me why it's checked you know so an unchecked ego with and and this is where i think the word discipline kind of gets, and we were talking about this the other day at the gym, the word discipline kind of gets a bad rap. Yeah, 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 yeah. A nice, a nice uh, shift in perspective for the word discipline could just be responsibility. Mm. I love what you talked about, about not, I'm not trying to check my ego against the boards and beat it up. It's just calling my ego to responsibility. My ego can simultaneously help me navigate the world if it's right-sized if it's uh, prioritized, if, if, if getting drunk is my main priority, I'm not simultaneously concerned with my mom's safety. Right. Maybe I have my priorities out of order there. If getting drunk is my main priority, I'm probably not going to show up to work on time or show up at all. My priorities are a little skewed there. 
I lose the job. I lose the relationships with family. I hurt the people closest to me. And I can't understand why my world is just so terrible. I hate living this way. I, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's, yeah, you have an unchecked ego. What's wrong is my ego is out of control. Yes, and how you check it is to make sure that you align on the vertical mm. and bring awareness to what the vertical means for you. Yes. Yes, I know it's important as an addict that I go to the gym so I get endorphins and release those. A lot of physiological things happen that helps me not to succumb to my addiction if I go to the gym. So physically, check. Yep. Mentally, I know not to put myself in situations or watch things on television or listen to things, whether it be listening to a relative on the phone that's full of negativity that I have mm -hmm. to listen to for an hour. I'm not going to do that. I'm choose to check that. I'm not going to answer the call when that crazy aunt calls me because after she calls me, I usually go to my addiction. Interesting. Yes, you see what I'm yes, saying? Absolutely. So, you know, and then spiritually, I know I need to do a spiritual practice. What does that look like for me? Yeah. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's affirmations. Maybe it's, it's following a course or reading, you know, a course in miracles is a great 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 book to buy for four bucks on ebay and go through all of those yeah. there's another one called a course in love it's the same thing whether i'm in a treatment you know and i'm following steps or whatever that they have mm -hmm. all of those things are so important on the spiritual mental physical emotional you have to have you have to have some type of organization that aligns with the vertical absolutely. If that makes sense absolutely that organization allows me to take responsibility for checking my ego. It helps me take responsibility for navigating the world. I can begin to map my world in a more productive, fulfilled way, whole existence type of way, if I have a design for living. Yes, a, these, a meaning. Yes, these tools become not only a meaning or a purpose, but they become a design mm -hmm. to get through my day. I know how to navigate my day today because I have these tools. I have this checklist. I have this. I'm going to pray first thing in the morning. I'm going to align with vertical dimension first thing. I'm going to go work out. I'm going to get my body feeling good and pop the endorphins mm -hmm. and have a sense of accomplishment. I know that I'm taking care of the vehicle that's going to get me through the rest of my life. Check. I'm going to be of service to others. I'm going to help other people take care of their vehicle mm -hmm. and align them with vertical dimension. How can I help share these type of teachings? Going through the day of service also means going through the day taking responsibility for myself, my family, and my community. And I, I, cause I, I want to stay here because I think this is so important. When we think of this unchecked, it's such a powerful word. We're lining up with the vertical. We're giving our life meaning. We're doing it daily. We're being proactive. We're allowing higher self to be in charge, not the ego to be pro to reactive in charge. But on top of it, this is the beautiful part, I think more than anything, is when we begin to be in charge or take responsibility and allowing our higher self to come through, the things that we begin to do, we begin to enjoy them. Mm. But on the flip side, the dichotomy of that is, when we become more self-aware and we're doing these practices, we're like, oh, you know what? Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I didn't go to the gym. And then Friday night, I got triggered. Oh, oh yeah. the last week, I look at my notes. I, I, I looked over my things, you know, my to-do list. The, the week, la last week, Tuesday, I was really triggered to drink alcohol, you know, or do drugs. Oh, and I didn't go to the gym three days before that either. Very interesting. Yes. You see yes. see what begins to happen? I have a ledger. I have yes. a, I have a barometer. I have mm -hmm. a, I have a way to track my progress or not. Mm -hmm. To 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 track my uh sin for a lack of a better word. My I missed the mark there. I didn't I didn't go to the gym six times this week. I didn't go three times this week. I didn't even go at all. So the further and further I get from the being the man I want to be which is the man that is aligned with spirit, which is the man that is of service to others, which is a man I can be proud of. The further and further I get from the shoes of inner being, mm -hmm. the worse and worse I feel. That's my ledger. That's my checklist. I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. I'm probably not standing in the shoes of inner being. 
and it doesn't feel good. And well, I'm just waiting for a trigger then. I, I, enough of that it's doesn't reactive yes, and enough of that doesn't feel good and it's easy to succumb to the trigger. You know, triggers are all around us. Really, trigger is it's important and and you know, we want to take responsibility for what's going on inside of ourselves. Otherwise, I'm just the victim of the trigger. Yeah. So really, not, yeah. what's going on is I'm the trigger. Dwayne Yardman Frank is the trigger. Trigger is a nice therapist word that helps us understand situations. But if I'm not doing the appropriate work to be whole and complete on the inside from vertical dimension, then I'm still the victim of the outside world. Uh, and unfortunately, victims never recover. That's so good. I want to, uh, because we're, you know, pretty close here. So we're going to do a, a part two of this, but I want to get a little bit into ego and addiction and kind of get into how, what the, e, how the ego responds to your addiction mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. kind of take it. And then we'll get into some practical steps in the next one. Um, the material says in addiction, the ego often engages in denial and self deception to preserve our self image. Now that statement right there, dude, out of the whole podcast, if you don't hear anything else, yeah. <laughs> this is this is this is the key to addiction right here. In addiction, I'm going to say this again: the ego often, keyword, often engages in denial and self-deception. To this is another keyword. We're studying words is so important to preserve mm. our self-image. Now, where did the self-image image come from? From my ego, <laughs> from my ego that is simultaneously absorbing the world stimuli mm -hmm. but now i'm in the midst of my addiction and the world stimuli is not very pretty mm -mm. I'm, I'm i'm in a crack house mm -hmm. oh no no i'm walking the streets because i'm homeless because i lost my job no no i uh i just got beat up in a bar mm -hmm. and now i'm black and blue and bloody no no so the the self-image that i have is it's, it's so easy for me to pretend that that's okay if I'm simultaneously in denial mm -hmm. and in self-deception from my addiction. My and addiction I allows me to turn a blind eye yes, that's to okay. reality. I don't really have to look at reality. I can actually almost kind of push that out of my uh, my, my line of sight. It's not even really in my peripheral at all. Uh, you know, we talk about an obsession. An obsession is a thought that blocks out all other thoughts. And if, in my, if I'm in my addiction, I have an obsession for that ab addiction. And the ego helps me, t helps me take that to an extreme. It's all or nothing. I'm just going all the way. I'm all in. And I can't see that I'm hurting myself. I can't see that I'm hurting others. I can't see that my behavior is destructive and I'm pushing people away from me. Mm. I can't see any of that. The ego helps blind me to my selfishness. The ego blinds me to my self-centeredness. I don't have to look at it. I don't have to take responsibility to it. And my addiction just gets worse and worse. Yeah, and I, I like the denial and self-deception, uh, especially, you know, and, and I've shared this before, but Every time I read that, when I read this, I think of this statement. It was Jesse on Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. you know, and he kept doing things. He kept doing things, staying in the in the form it, to fuck things up. Like you would, it would be blatant. It's like, bro, you're gonna you're screwing yourself over here majorly. But at the end, like the last season, he finally got to the point, or second season, or whatever. He finally got to the point where he said, second to last season, he said, "I'm just a bad person." So I'm just going to do bad yeah. things because I'm just a bad person. And so his ego turned around and said, your self-image, because of all the stimuli that happened to you and all this bad shit that happened to you that you created, you're the creator of your reality, you created all that shit. You could have said no, not got involved, not done the drugs, not got the girl. I mean, the girl that was in an attic program, do you remember that? And then oh, she yeah. ends up dying because he gets her back into... Uh, drugs, you know, and then he has to play out that she's not there or whatever. And then Walter White does this thing with that. But I'm just a bad person or I'm just an addict. It's the same scenario. Mm -hmm. That's your ego 
trying to preserve you. And your self-image can evolve over the trauma and the drama that happens to you. To the point where, like, Dwayne, where you had said, you know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, like, especially when you were in the hospital, you know, and, and you had such a dose of humility, you know, and then you, your ego didn't know how to process the humility. So it's like, I'm not taking shoes from a dead person. No, my ego had already rebuilt. <laughs> yeah. I just got the ass kicking of my life. <laughs> and my ego rebuilt in a few hours. And um, I was still judging the world around me. I still was superior. I still was acting in denial and self-deception which allowed me to not have to look at my side of the street. I don't have to look at my side of the street. I don't have to look at my behavior. I couldn't possibly take responsibility for my role in my addiction. I can just push that away with denial. I can push that away with my victim uh, uh, self-delusionment. If, if, if you guys behave differently, I wouldn't have to drink. And then, like you said, with the Breaking Bad, it's so good. I just, I'm, no, no, I'm just going to own this like a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. I'm just a bad person. I'm just, a, of course I'm an alcoholic. I've been an alcoholic for years. I know that. I know I'm an alcoholic. That's who I am. I just drink. And it's, that's just pride in reverse. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's, yeah. I, I, it's not a good thing, but I'm still just thinking about me. It's his negative thoughts. It's their, their, their crushing blows, but I'm still just thinking all about me. Because how you can, the, the rational ego mind can handle this. And I always do this test. And, and I ask somebody, and this is going to be controversial uh, when I say this too, but you can ask that person, if I could take, you think, you're an, you think you're an addict, you're addicted, you're an alcoholic, that's what you are. If I can wave a magic wand right now and take that out of your life, where you would have no desire for alcohol, you would have no remembrance of alcohol, and you would just live a normal life, would you accept that? Majority of people would say yes. Yeah. I think majority, they'd be yeah, it's, it's, it, deep down inside if they knew that that was real. I, and the, why I'm going to be controversial is I talked to somebody about this with overeating and, mm. and a food addiction. And I said, if I could wave a magic wand and give you what the world thinks is a perfect body, and I'm not judging bodies or anything like that. I'm just saying what the world thinks is a perfect body, would you accept that? And I said, how many... People, especially women, because there's all this stuff that's put on women about how they should look yes. and all that. I was like, what the world views is like Kim Kardashian's body or whatever. You know, I can give you that right now. Would you accept that? And they said, of course. And I say, well, then you're at dis ease with what you're telling yourself, compared to you're justifying your food addiction and saying you're okay. Mm -hmm. with your weight when I just told you would have told me no you would have said I don't want Kim Kardashian's body I love my body I love the way I look right if I'm coming from the shoes of inner being yes yes in fact I had a, a friend today post on um, social media saying why do I still not have a man and then they put another picture of a woman that was larger than them and with a guy they like she has a guy why don't I? I'm smaller than she is. Mm. Now, this is an overweight person judging another overweight person. Yes. And, yes. and saying, look, I'm a little bit small. I'm still overweight, but I'm a little bit smaller. And I, I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now. So I was obese. You know, I'm probably borderline now. So I'm not, and I have food addiction. So I, I'm talking in this realm, and I think I have a right to talk in this realm because I battled this. And, and you're a personal trainer, and you see this all the time. You deal with people that are ashamed of their body. Mm -hmm. Now, the shame can come from societal norms, and those can be all screwed up because we know it's unrealistic on Instagram, and we've talked about that before. But if you could not say, I am completely happy in this, then you're at dis-ease, disease. Yeah, yeah. That's such a, that's such a high aim. That's such a lofty goal. But lofty goals are the right direction for me if I'm trying to get in alignment with my spirit. Um, lofty question is a nice tool that helps me re-identify who I am. One of our great spiritual teachings is the universe doesn't give you what you want. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want a nice body. Oh, I want loads of money in the bank. 
Oh, I want to, my kids to love me. Oh, I want not to die drunk. The universe does not give you what you want. The universe gives you what you are. So the lofty question exercise is reaffirming my identity, what I am. So I just ask the question. It's lofty. It's a big question. Why is it so easy for me to enjoy and love my body the way it is? Mm-hmm. Why is it so easy for me to appreciate the abundance that I have? Why is it so easy for me to tap into infinite abundance? Because when you begin to do that affirmation, the poison, whether it's drugs, food, alcohol, bottle, whatever it may be, that's all poison going into your physical system. Yes. You begin to understand, I love myself. Why would I hurt myself? I'm only hurting myself because I'm hurting inside. Very good. Very good. So reaffirming my identity with the lofty questions. Why is it so easy for me to appreciate the body I have? Why is it so easy for me to enjoy the present moment? Why is it so easy for me to access the present moment? Why is it so easy for me to love the body I'm in? If I'm not practicing a spiritual development, if I don't have a spiritual approach to life, I cannot answer that question, no. I cannot tell you, no, I don't want to be in Kim Kardashian's body. I look the way I love looking the way I look. I have to have a present moment practice. I have to have a honor the God inside of me practice. That practice takes millions of different forms. It's different for everybody. We, that's what this podcast is all about, is encouraging everyone out there to find their own practice that works for them, to have their own checklist to get them through the day, to have their own design for living. You get to create it, you get to build it, you get to honor it, and you get to fuck it up. It's totally up to you. The responsibility is all on me. Once I stopped sidestepping responsibility... I was no longer the victim of society's opinion of how I'm supposed to look. I was no longer the victim of this controlling addiction that is killing me. I can empower myself when I take responsibility for navigating my world. It's not your responsibility. I'm not two anymore. I don't get to put that on anybody else. I have to take responsibility for navigating my world now. Spiritual tools, such as lofty questions, mantras, prayers, checklists, makes it possible. It, make, it, it, it enables me to have a life worth living. I enjoy getting through my day today. When I'm in my active addiction, I did not enjoy that, that, uh, that existence. Death would have been a step up from that existence. It's too miserable. It's too miserable. It's, it, and, and I don't want to be the person that answers yes. Yes, yeah, please change me. I mean, y- yes, we always have a high aim and we want to improve, but I don't want to be living in a delusion that if you could wave a wand and make me better, I'll just wait for that. Let me wait for the magic wand. It's, no, there is no magic wand. That magic wand looks like a two by four with responsibility (laughs) (laughs) written down the side. And, uh, you know, short form spiritual practices take responsibility for your fucking life.